it's an absolute uh, thrill to be able to introduce uh, Professor Pat Thompson as well, and I'm so I'm so grateful that you're here, Pat. Uh, Pat works at the University of Nottingham, and she's a convener of the Center for Research in Arts, Creativity, and Literacies. Her research focuses on the arts and creativity in school and community change, and on doctoral and research education and writing. Current research includes tracking arts learning and engagement in senior secondary performing and visual arts with the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Tate, uh, life stories of young adults involved in the Tate Circuit program, and an evaluation of the Serpentine Gallery's World Without Walls program. But many of you know her uh, uh, longer standing work as well. Pat was instrumental in the creative partnerships work in the UK over the last 15 or so years, and I know personally I've used her work around that and the evaluation, the critical evaluation that she did of that program after its 12 years of running, and then uh, her summation of that and its cultural significance and so on. Really deeply important work, and she's also collaborated with other leaders, Julian Septon Green, Guy Claxton, Anna Kraft, and other people. So, you know, your body of work is enormous, and I'm so thrilled to have you here. Pat Thompson. Thanks very much for the invitation, Anne, Sue and Kim, um, and for organising uh, for me to uh, be able to come to AARE, which is very expensive, um, particularly as the pound seems to have taken a bit of a tumble oh, oh, recently. Oh, 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 we oh, won't yes. talk about that. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking that uh, it would have been better if I went before Pam, because I'm about to do a giant downer, I suspect. But then on the other hand, perhaps it's good to know, as I do my bit, that, that some of this actually does exist. Um, so I'm really going to, I guess, talk about the kind of macro issue related to um, what I call the creative arts, and that's a, a kind of an interesting signifier, isn't it? And it's, I, I think, suggests in education that not all arts learning is creative. Um, in fact, there is some deadly dull arts learning that goes on um, in schools, and so, and I don't want to pretend um, otherwise. Uh, but my particular um, focus in, in this talk is really what is happening um, to arts, what are called, would, might be called arts subjects. Um, in England in the kind of general context of uh, what we would understand to be this kind of discourse which um, Anne's alluded to I think already. Um, I mean since you know Tony Blair came to power you know in the company of Blur and other kind of cool Brits and um, part of the kind of discourse in um, not only England but actually Britain more generally um, is around the creative industries and to try and create a kind of an identification of the UK with um, creativity and with in particular whatever is known as the creative industries. Um, and so there's a lot of talk about, um, I think a lot of policy talk about how important the creative industries are without ever actually defining what they are. But whenever there's lots of this kind of stuff um, around, lots of um, pictures of, of people that you'd know in the music industry, in the film industry, in television, in advertising, in engineering, with people like, you know, Dyson Bax and whatever. Um, <clears throat> however, the arts actually are really are struggling, as they are everywhere politically. Um, you know, governments really are reluctant to kind of invest in the arts. And so arts organisations in particular and people who are interested in the arts, um, so we go from kind of peak bodies like arts councils, um, in, I'm going to talk particularly about Arts Council England, um, but arts councils in the four nations, um, other kind of people like academics, um, artists, um, are very have been concerned for a long time to try and defend the arts. And typically, this is how they've been defended. They've been defended by making that kind of automatic connection between the creative industries and the practices of art. But that's, kind of, that's actually fallen apart in Britain. That argument is no longer persuasive and it's demonstrably not worked because there's been continued um, withdrawal of funding in the UK from the arts despite this kind of rhetoric still going on. So lots of people are now concerned with trying to measure 
the, what the arts do. Now, we, and I'm just going to show you some of some of what's kind of going on at the moment, so you can see. Um, so the Arts Council have launched a big program which is going to require every organisation that they fund to be to demonstrate their impact in some way or another using what are called the quality metrics. Now interestingly this has been developed by a bunch of Australians, um, <laughs> by an Australian kind of um, quango of some description, well it's a private company basically, um, and bought um, so the, you know the connection between the two places might be working in England but you know expect you might see a version of this I suspect. But these are what are being suggested um, as a kind of self-report rubric, if you like, in the first instance. Um, so when organisations are reporting back to the Arts Council on what has happened, then they're going to be expected, and this is being trialled at the moment, they're going to be expected to be able to report what their audience thought according to these kind of criteria. So you might end up going to a kind of a, a performance in a village hall somewhere, um, I think of one of the kind of theatre companies that, that we work with which specialises in kind of taking performances um, into villages um, and you might get given a handheld which has got a kind of a survey like this. You just thought you were going for a nice night out and suddenly <laughs> now you've got to fill in some bloody survey. You know, and, you, and I think we can expect to see a lot more of that now in the arts um, and people will be being asked to fill in the surveys and actually they'll matter an enormous amount. They will make the difference um, in some ways to who's going to get funded and who's not. So there'll be arts companies that will now have to divert some of their staff time as we are accustomed to seeing in schools um, to have people who manage the data, who are able to produce this kind of performative uh, as not only the performance in the, that there, but also a performative version of the performance um, to the Arts Council in order to keep going. This, uh, there's been a special kind of rubric developed now for youth arts. So um, organisations are already, anybody who works and who is funded to work in, uh, in youth arts now has to work according to these kinds of principles. And so I find myself, for example, doing works with, with uh, local arts organisations in Nottingham and helping them to try and understand what they do, or that's what I thought I was doing. And then halfway through, I get asked if I can then make my data go against these kind of quality principles, um, as opposed to um, working in some other way with the, with the kind of data that we, we're collectively generating. Um, so, and the, these principles have been tested out, you can see by the equivalent of ACR, NFER, um, and they've been found to be, you know, something or other, <coughs> good, good enough to be rolled out. So, you know, this kind of measurement um, is, is going on. It's, it's quite at the moment, you can see it's kind of qualitative, yeah, so we're aggregating. But it's moved people away from um, what they typically did, actually, which was, you know, a few narratives and a few pictures um, were the kind of evaluations that art, arts organisations typically produced. And this was seen as inadequate. Um, and a lot of arts organisations were frustrated themselves about that. But what they've now being put into is this kind of standardised rubric. So it's important to understand that. And when there's a kind of discussion about this, this actually then comes back. This comes back as the rationale for having the quality because it's quality experiences and quality arts performances. So quality is the new is the new kind of discourse now that enables the bridge between an arts experience and the creative industries. It's this kind of notion of quality that we can measure. Um, uh, one of the research projects that I'm working on at the moment with uh, um, Rebecca Coles, who uh, was formerly a PhD student of mine, she's, um, she's a very good um, ethnographer and qualitative researcher, 
and we've been following 26 young people through art school um, and through kind of gallery programs. We're now in the third year um, of waves of kind of interviews looking at their experience. The arts have always been precarious. The visual arts in particular have always been a tricky place to try and actually make a living at. But, you know, we're seeing <laughs> it's, not quite, it's not quality that's going to actually get these young people work. It's something or other else. You know, we're seeing downward mobility. There's a chasm between um, the art school and work in what might be called a creative industry. Even if you thought a gallery was a creative industry, most of them don't like the idea of being called a creative industry. They see themselves as having a public mission, generally, if they're not commercial, a commercial gallery. Many galleries are, are publicly funded. They don't see themselves as a creative industry, but they're often places where visual artists are able to actually get some part-time work. Um, to um, kind of sustain themselves. There's a kind of serial internship now in the name of placements, um, <coughs> which are partly propagated through art schools and universities. It's just terribly difficult now for young, for young adults to actually make their way into what this much hyped um, and indeed very profitable, it is very profitable industry. Um, in the UK, but how you get there as a young person um, is incredibly difficult and the kind of talented young people we see get, are just getting so depressed and actually s starting to not talk about themselves as artists. One of the big things that's kind of emerging is that while they're at art school, they think about themselves as artists and having an art practice, and the longer they're struggling out in the world, the less they see themselves as artists, and the less they see their art practice as actually being a kind of major part of their life. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a it's a depressing project. <laughs> It, however, this kind of discourse is not without challenge in the UK. One of the major challenges came from one of the funding councils, the Arts and Humanities Research Council. You would know, I'm sure, in the UK that the, the, uh, there's been a division of research councils. It may not continue much longer, but it has, it, it has been the case that um, the Arts and Humanities have their own, of course, much less well-funded research council. Um, and they initiated something called cultural value. Um, and the idea of the cultural value program was to, to try and develop something other than a kind of set of instrumental notions of what the arts might, writ large, what they might do, and to articulate some form of, of value which went beyond the creative industries. Okay, so that was much broader. And the report that's been written, and you can download it from the, from the web, it's been written by Geoffrey Krosick um, and Patricia Kaczynska. Um, and Jeff Krosick is now the kind of chair of the board of the Craft Councils UK. He's, he's um, an historian by background. Um, but it's a, it's a very interesting report. It's a good report, really, in the context of this kind of economised discourse of creative industry. And you can see the mix of kind of things that they talk about in the, um, in the report. So they talk about peace building and healing, for instance. They talk about um, a complex ecology of actually, you know, the, the reality that, are, that we see in the uh, young adults' lives trying to get into um, some form of creative occupation. They talk about the kind of complex ecology, ecology of that and the, the pits that people can fall down. They talk about health and subjective well-being, you know. So this is not a, um, a crude kind of report. They, do, they did have a, um, a, a, I guess a section of, of the work which looked at um, the arts and education. They didn't fund a lot of uh, projects. One of the projects they funded was a review of the Creative Art, uh, Partnerships Archive, which um, I did with some of my, co some of my colleagues. Um, we hold the Creative Art and Partnerships Archive at Nottingham. Um, and I, I also work with some colleagues at Tate on a kind of methodological problem, but there weren't a lot of educational programs funded. But Jeff and Patricia were very interested in education and one of the things I think that you know I'm very pleased that they took up very seriously is this kind of last notion 
questioning the hierarchy of subjects that mean we're interested in whether studying music improves ability in maths, but not whether studying maths improves ability in music. So, you know, they, they have really kind of taken this up very seriously. And uh, I think that's the fact that it's there in a report, I think, allows us to speak back um, to some of that kind of discourse which says, um, you know, we must fund, and I've just seen another project funded, in fact, um, by the Educational Endowment Foundation, which again is looking to see whether art subjects improve people's test results. Um, so, you know, we've got that, that's an international phenomenon that we might want to talk about at some point as well. Um, okay, nevertheless, there's a lot, I think as Pam has indicated, there's lots of very vibrant arts practice going on. Um, a lot of it is happening in schools. This is a, uh, a um, senior secondary um, dance class not too far away from where I work. However, this is the next bit of bad news, the EBAC. The EBAC began in 2015 and it makes a, uh, for students who enrolled in uh, 2015, they are the first students to do the EBAC, um, so they haven't quite got to the subject choices yet, but the subject choice implications of EBAC have already kicked in, as I want to show you. So the EBAC is English, Maths, History or Geography, the Sciences and a Language. Um, there has been an enormous debate about whether and why um, artistic and creative technology, technology, technological subjects are not included. Um, and I'll come to the kind of um, advocacy groups at the end of what I'm going to say. But I think it's important to understand that the arts now no longer count officially for the mid-year and indeed because of that the final kind of qualification um, in high school. So what effect does that have? Well, let's have a look. So here's the changes that are already happening. Um, we can see that um, the number of students involved in art and design subjects has dropped by 33%. Okay, this is, you, can, you can see other kind of changes as well. They're not the only subjects that are, that are dropping. Um, a particular form of English literature this is English literature as opposed to um, a technical language study. That is also dropping. So um, it's not simply those subjects that we might think about like performing or expressive arts. There's a kind of concentration going on um, in these areas. You know, bizarrely sociology. As a cultural sociologist, I'm a bit bemused by that, but there you go. Uh, <laughs> But you can, you can see the kinds of subjects that are dropping and those that are, that are um, going up. Um, the DfE has just re released, actually a few months ago, just released some pretty disturbing um, data. So what we can see is that these enrolments translate mm. into less teachers. Okay, it's actually what is happening people are actually losing their jobs now if they're working in the arts. They are being made redundant as schools are getting rid of whole subject areas. So we can see um, design and technology, which we'd understand as the old tech studies, which kind of became computerised up and is kind of associated now with um, CAD design, with 3D design, with that, that kind of work. That's had the biggest drop of, of all, which is kind of interesting because you you might expect that might be where it's, uh, it's held. So this is the teacher headcount drop. Okay, so important to understand that's actually what's going on. Um, testing regimes and the kind of tests that there is here in NAPLAN has also had an impact. Um, so, you know, there's less time in primary schools um, particular kinds of schools are cutting the arts, so academies are spending, which are typically um, schools which are under, under pressure around their results. They're particularly getting rid of art subjects. Um, oh look, independent schools, etc. The, the privileged schools are the ones which are hanging on to the arts and place much, much greater value on museums and working with artists and whatever. So, and that's the National Society for Education in Art and Design. 
There has just been a new announcement um, of continued investment in music education. It was, it's been billed as arts, but actually it's music education. Um, that's a fine thing and no one would argue against that. Um, however, um, there is now a kind of division being carved within the arts, which I think we have to hang on to. There is a lot of political opposition to this in a whole range of ways. It's happening at all kinds of, in all kinds of levels. There's a thing called the Cultural Learning Alliance, which is the peak body. It's got 11,000 members. Every arts organisation in the country um, is in it. They're politically quite powerful. The Tories quite like the opera, for example, so that is a bit of a problem for them when some of their pet organisations are arguing um, about some problems in, in, with arts and uh, arts education and arts funding. The youth bridge organisations are working very hard to try and promote things like Arts Mark and Arts Award, which are general, more creative cultural arts programs across schools. Um, the Arts Council have launched creative education partnerships in 50 schools. The one in Bristol is a kind of trial um, that you can see very easily on the web. There's, a, there's also the activity in London which has been, um, had additional funding but which is very interesting in creating new partnerships. Um, the ARC, AHRC continues to fund work, research in the arts um, which brings together academics and practitioners um, people are using the impact agenda to forge alliances between academics, schools, arts organisations, individual artists. There's new research programs being funded all by, in particular, three organisations, um, Arts Council England, um, the Kaluskal Benkian Foundation that have got just had a, a big funding round. Um, they don't advertise, but they've selected a set of um, city-wide programs that they're investing in and Paul Hamlin Foundation have developed a new set of priorities. These are all geared to trying to generate evidence of the importance of the arts and a lot of us now have shifted our work into that kind of area um, because of the kind of crisis that there now is in arts funding. We try and maintain a bit of joyful work um, as Pam has shown you, but a lot of us are now in very defensive mode and engaging and uh, dancing with the devil around the question of measurement. Thank you.